Hey, 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 this is Apostle Love. How are you? How are you? Uh, welcome to Easter Sunday. I'm glad that you guys could tune in. No, I do not have an Easter sermon, but I'm going to give what God has told me to give on this morning. I know I, I know that um, I did air, even though I was out of town, I did air the lesson for last week. And so I pray that uh, you got it. Um, again, if you're tuning in from my wall, so let me explain how this goes. There is Church of the Outcast, the page, Church of the Outcast, the group. I do not put anything on my wall uh, for Sundays unless God tells me to. And that's where we are today. Um, will it stay up there? I may pin it to the wall so that it stays pinned, but I may delete it from the bottom of my line. But there is a reason that this is up here today. Let me first say thank you for all the birthday wishes. Um, I appreciate it. Definitely was heartfelt. Don't think I take uh, any of it for granted. Again, when you get my age, you first take vacations. And then number two, you don't take uh, take things for granted. So I want to appreciate that. I have a lot to cover today. Um, and I'm excited about what God is doing. The other thing I wanted to tell you, we're in the process. Again, I'm not a novice. I, I get these little slide comments, y'all, and I be trying to ignore them because I want to be mature. You know what I'm saying? You try to act like God raised you with some good sense. But when people think they've never heard of you and they start trying to uh, come at you, I'm not the come at queen. Like I'm I'm not that. I'm not going to do nothing ignorant or crazy, but every now and then, you know, I, I want to make sure I, I walk in God's character, but I'm not a novice to that. And so we're in the process of revamping our original uh, Pitt University website, which I believe it's still up, pittuniversity.org. And so we're really preparing it for the launch that God has been talking about. Also, what I'm really excited about, we just got the first cover back. And so this is an eight manual series, along with homework books and different things of that nature. So that by the time we're done in one year, trust me, I'm not giving you everything on Sunday morning. I'm only giving you a smidgen of it, but you can go back and you can go um, into the actual eight manuals and the other additional lessons and the workbook and the worksheets. And you can teach it to your church. You can teach it to yourself and allow God to talk to you. I realize that we live in a day and time where people want to say, well, you know, you better sit up under somebody and you better submit. I, I, I'm all for it. I've done my time. I have done my servitude. But can I say something? There's so much foolishness right now in the body of Christ and everybody's trying to control people and we want to, we're hurting people and we're killing people. And that's not the business that God is into. Okay, y'all, I'm, I'm tired. I don't like how it looks. So y'all got to just kind of forgive me. I'm having a moment to say here. And so I want to make sure that, um, that if God has you in the cave of isolation, you're not without his word. You're not without something to help you through the season. Is that all right? So I want to kind of like put that out there like that. But again, we'll talk more into that. But I did want to bring it up because I was excited. The cover is fire. And um, one of the things I do believe in as we start this lesson on this morning is the fact that um, I think that every generation thinks that they have the up on what God is doing and what God is saying. And I never want to be that person. Um, I think that generations come along and we build upon the last generation until we have come to the fulfillment, which we know that Christ is a fulfillment. So if Christ was a fulfillment, we can never become the fulfillment because he already fulfilled it. But what we can do is be sensitive enough and every, got sensitive to God in every generation and begin to build on what he laid and what the other generation laid behind. And that is my endeavor of how I teach it. I will share with you what I was, what I, what I learned, who I set up under. Yes, I will do that. And um, because I want you to understand that you don't stand before a novice. All right. And I don't normally do that, but I only do it when God wants me to. So you're going to find out some of the names I set up under today um, as we go through the lesson. Is that all right? Again, I want to go ahead, open up in prayer. And again, I don't believe in Easter. All right. I know that you all say happy resurrection day. So I'm going to go ahead and say to you, happy resurrection day. But let me be clear about something. Every day ought to be a day that we remember what Jesus did for us. Today is no different. But again, I understand why we do what we do. But I'm going to obey God because my assignment 
is one year to teach from the prophetic to profit. So let's go. Father God, I think I'm going to praise you for what you're doing and what you have done. I think I'm going to praise you, Father God, for every vessel and every voice that will begin to listen. But let me say this, God, I know you and I know what you are putting in my belly and what you have put and what you have commanded me to say. I am asking that this one right here let it pierce the souls of your prophets everywhere and let them begin to question and to come to understand the magnitude by which you have called them in the diversity in which they walk. And Father God, I give you praise and glory. Holy Ghost, you know how I do. You got this. You preach, I speak. You say, I say. And Father God, I give you the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go to work. So, of course, I put it up here for you to see. And if you're listening from my YouTube page, I mean, from Facebook page or whatever, then uh, you'll hear. Hopefully that's big enough. Okay. So the lesson today is, go back to the front. We're dealing with God's prophetic framework. Um, when I started doing this, you know, God is so cool how he does stuff. Allow me to I'll get up and get down depending. But as I was uh, going through this, God wanted me to go back and make sure that we're talking about framework, but I did not define what a framework is. And I want to make sure that you're understanding because too many people are, are feeling as if they don't fit or they'll say, I don't fit like everybody else. I'm not like everyone else. You weren't supposed to be like everyone else. You're supposed to be you, but you fit within the framework of what God created. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's get there. Uh, so what is a framework? Um, I'm sorry, let me go back. I got to do it on my page. So a framework is defined as an essential supporting structure of a building, a vehicle or an object. If I had to do it my way, I would say, um, Here's a box. That's the framework. The frame. The frame is the box or, or the square. When I build, I'm building upon and with I can build within and I can build around or on top of. Why? Because the frame is only the beginning of the work. It's not the end all of the work. It's the beginning of the work. As I build within the framework, I may construct smaller frames to build upon. But initially, the architect is the one that sets the frame. And, and I, okay. Um, so, for example, uh, last week, if you listen to the lesson, we dealt with the three most common parts of what the Hebrew um, defines as a type of a prophet. And remember, they were Nabi. I'm sure you can see it from your screen, right? And if you're listening in, you can take notes. There was the Nabi or Navi. And we said that this prophet was the spokesperson. And we based this particular one off of what? Genesis 20 and 7, where God calls Abraham a prophet, all right? It's not the first time a prophet is listed, but for whatever reason, well, we know part of the reason was because they took out the books, all right? But we know because we've already been through that, so you're coming in on the middle of a conversation, I'm going to need you to be silent and go listen to the other one. That's not being rude. That's just saying you're coming in the middle of a conversation and they've been here a minute. So it's not fair to go back and do a, a, a history cap to make you feel good about yourself when you just need to stop, pause, and go to the other teachings. And so... Uh, we had Enoch and we had his family. So we'll deal with them later because they are within the framework. We're just not going to deal with it right now. So it, according to Genesis 20 and 7, we had Abraham. And the Bible says that the usage was, I believe it was 50-30, uh, if I remember correctly. And we, that's where we get Nabi from. And so it means a spokesman a speaker, a prophet, as you can see on your slide. But it also is not limited to just a regular prophet. It says a false prophet, a heathenistic prophet. I didn't make it up. That's what Strong said. We have the Rohi. The Rohi is a seer, as often rendered, but also abstract, a vision, one that sees more through vision or through sight. And again, these are frameworks, all right? And then we have Hopsi or Quotsi. 
um, a person that can see and or perceive. So Rohi and Quotsi kind of are synonymous or synonyms of one another. Notice at the bottom of your screen, let me make sure you guys can see it on stream as well. You may not be, hold on, hold on. There we go, all right. You have clairvoyant, stay with me. Remember our definition, Navi said that it can be a false prophet or a prophet. We're not, we're not right now trying to determine kingdoms. We're trying to determine the gift, all right? So a clairvoyant is a person who claims to have a supernatural ability to perceive events in the future, i.e. psychic, beyond the normal sensory. So like, the, like according to our definition only, that uh, this word clairvoyant is basically a Navi. I ain't got to make it up. All you got to do is know how this word study. And then we have psychic. Now, what I did was I purposely went and found words that we use every day. So we have clairvoyant, psychic, and witch. Psychic is related to the denoting of the faculties of a phenomenon that are apparently inexplicable by nature laws evolving telepathic clairvoyant. So again, clairvoyant, that psychic goes under clairvoyant. Now notice this. I noticed that when I was picking out the definition for psychic, it says that it is a bridge. A bridge of what? Denotes a bid that deliberately misrepresents the bidder's hand in, in order to mislead. So a psychic is a person that 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 if if let me how do I want to say it? Let's do it this way. I don't have another way to do this, so I'm going to say it. Many people are calling themselves prophets, but really you're nothing but a psychic. If I take out the word psychic from the upper definition I just used, I'm going to use the word bridge. You are saying that you are a prophet of God, but really you are a psychic that is doing what? You're creating a bridge. D listen, denoting a bid that deliberately misrepresents the bidder's hand. So in other words, you're saying that you're a psych, you're a prophet, but really you are deliberately misleading the kingdom that you say you stand for. Well, prophet, why would anyone do that? You would do that because you want to get in the women, the men of God's spirit. So you call yourself a prophet, but you ain't nothing but a gift that's acting as a bridge between kingdoms, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan. And now you're posing as the bridge trying to inflict the people of God. And then we have the most common witch. This is a person uh, that basically casts spells. They So they knowingly, the difference between the witch and the psychic if it is, is in all honesty, it is the fact that the psychic is the bridge, the pretender, <laughs> the pretender, because you acting like you of God, but your actions and what's coming out your mouth is misleading, but it is misleading deliberately. The witch, the witch is the witch. The witch is the one that casts spells incantations. She is just as deliberate, but she don't think about who she is. Let's pause right here. It is only in the body of Christ that we look at people and say, oh, that's a witch. Are you in their house to see them cast spells? Are you sitting in the comfort of their home uh, seeing what they're doing? This is why we're getting in trouble because let's go back to our definitions to make this fair. Go back to the definition. It says that these are the three most commonly used uh, prophetic uh, in the Hebrew. These are the most common used in the Hebrew Bible. Navi, Roha, and Kulti. But look at Navi. Navi says that yes, it, you, you are, you have the prophetic traits and you can either be of God, be of Satan or be a heathen. But the gift is Navi. Navi means to, to be a spokesperson. It doesn't say that because you're a spokesperson, you come from God. It just says, according to Hebrew, 
that this is what it means. So we, when we get into the other ones, as we just did, we got into the witch and the psychic. We said what? They got the clairvoyant. They work like the psychic and yeah, the psychic and the witch. It's a dangerous thing sometimes to be so quick to call a prophet of God a witch because you have no basis. I'm going I'm to I'm play ignorant with you or I'm going to play the devil's advocate, as they say. So you come on somebody's page or you hear them speak and you say, oh, that's a witch. What is the definition of a witch? It is a person that does spells and throws out incantations. Have you seen it? Baby, have you seen it? I can't sing, but I had to throw it in there. So number one, if you falsely accuse a person, you do understand that now you become the witch. Oh, prophet, prove it. Well, I'm, I'm going to prove it because Proverbs tells us that uh, where there, in other words, it talks about that where there is a curse, it a land. In other words, but what if you're wrong? You just sent a, a demonic, because out of your mouth is life and death, right? So you just spoke something and sent it in the words of a real prophet. So now the question is, are you the psychic? Remember our definition, or are you the witch? Let's go back to what, remember what psychic meant. Psychic, we have the psychic, which acts as a clairvoyant. But the difference with the psychic is what? Are you the bridge? What was the definition of the bridge? This type of psychic is one that deliberately, deliberately is trying to play poker. In other words, mislead people. So when you call somebody something and you have no evidence to support, tangible, have you eaten with them, broke with them? What did they say that made them give off signs of a witch? Or is it hearsay? Because the moment that you call them something, you put yourself as being a, a bridge, a psychic, which means that you put yourself in the position of being the bridge and you are deliberately misleading other people for whatever reason it may be. And then the witch. The witch is the one that is deliberately doing incantations. I want to help a lot of people. <laughs> My walk, I got all the stories in the world. And, and, and let me let me talk to some leaders before I go any further. Let me let me tell you something that, that, that I had to learn. And I'm trying to help you so you don't kill your people. Let's say you see something in their prophetic. In other words, you can acknowledge that they're a prophet, but there's something a little questionable about maybe the, not, it's not the delivery because that part is really not always them, but maybe it's just their everyday attitude or demeanor. Before you put your mouth on something that really might be of God, is it immaturity or is it the company they keep? Let me help you. I, girl, look, I, I would go to God and I would say, why do these folks keep talking about I'm some kind of witch? Like, I ain't no witch. I don't roll like that. You know, he just said, let me tell you what's happening. He's Holy Ghost is so smart. He said, Sandy, he said, there are people that hate you. They don't know you. They hate the God in you is what he's talking about. And they're sending prayers of witchcraft, which does what? It gets off an illusion that I'm one of them. But the truth of the matter is I ain't one of them. But if you're the onlooker and you don't know anything, then your spirit could be picking up mixed messages. And and, and we're going to, we, again, remember, we're, we're, we're in the second session. In case you're coming in late, I am in the second session. I am dealing with prophetic framework. Okay? Framework means that we have a square. Within the square lies the parameters in which I'm going to build. So we're, so we're showing you, number one, through scripture, how God began to build his prophets, i.e. after, before, but our focus now, because we've already done the history, is after the flood. So Hebrew tells us, again, we have three categories that the prophet falls into, Nabi, Holti, and Colsi. Nabi, which is the most common, Nabi is the one that God called Abraham in Genesis 20 and 7 when Abimelech was trying to take his wife. But but beyond that, we find out that Nabi also can mean a false prophet. Okay, so the reason I'm taking my time at right here at the clairvoyant and the psychic is because we're misidentifying one another. And we got to be careful. 
or we're going to get in trouble with God. All right. So hopefully I've caught you up the best of our ability, but let's go. We got a lot of work to cover today. Let's go on. Now, let's deal with framework because that's what I defined earlier. A framework, it is a real or conceptual structure intended to serve as a support, come on now, a guide for the building of a thing. A prophetic framework is built upon conceptual structures intended to serve as a support or a guide for building something. Now, we are all men and women of God, so let's go on and get down to the structure so you think I'm not talking no foolishness. What is the structure? It's the word of God. Come on, you see it? We started, listen, uh, uh, Genesis 2 and 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, stay with me, and all of the hosts therein, before I define this, so we have the King James on one side, and let's read what the, the English version says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their own vast array. Let me tell you about me, I love King, if I study, I'm going to King James. My Bible is set that way because I love dissecting words. Now, when I just want to get a quick read, I'm going to use the message version, which is not here today because I think it's very straightforward and it's really good. Like it's raw. Like if y'all talked, how, if y'all understood how the prophets talk back in the day, you would understand why they all needed to die according to the Kings because they was raw. So let's say, let's focus. The reason that we, if you're coming in again, I'm on the second session. The first session we dealt with uh, history. Everyone that has been with me, the reason we took our time to teach you word study, which is from our diagram, exegesis. The reason we go through the scripture and we exegesis is so that we can get the best and the closest interpretation, right? Now, history. History deals with the context of the time that we were in, and then culture deals with the day that we were in. The reason that this is very, very important is because we are trying to exegesis. We're trying to understand the history it came from and the culture of that time frame. That's how God is wanting us to build our framework because, <clears throat> excuse me, it is from Genesis on up that we're getting the framework of what God is saying. We're getting an ideal of what he meant. We're getting an ideal of how he built. Now, we're, we're, about, to, we're about to word study Genesis 2 and 1. Let's read it one more time. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts are in. Now, let, I, I, pray this, I pray this blesses you like it blessed me some 20 years ago when I first read it because it made, it made good sense. So let's deal with it. The word finish, and if you want to write, take notes down or whatever, you can do that. The word finish is 3615 in the strong. So remember in the Old Testament, you put an H and then you put 3615. You're going to come up to this verse, not no other verse, but you're going to start with the verse you're looking up. And this is what it says. It means done. But when we go further into the definition, it says all that follows are expressions of the definition in accordance with the language in which it was written. Uh, it, it's a primitive root. It may, listen to the listen to the seminar. It means to end. It means transitive to cease, to be finished, to perish. It means to complete, to prepare, to consume. It means to accomplish, to cease, to consume, to determine, to, to, to destroy and utterly destroy. It means we're done. It means to end, to expire. It means to cause, it cause to end, expire. It means to faint, to fail, to finish, to fulfill, to fully. All of this means finish. So, so, so when God says it was finished, you have to think like a God and not like a person. When he said it was finished, any and everything you can think about is in that word. I.e., he created, he finished, and then our walk began. We weren't there. So here we come in the middle of a conversation. And now we're trying to back up. And we're trying to understand what all finished. And what he's saying is, I saw you before you were created. But I called you into the plan, into the time and the culture that you were needed because I need you to be a part of what? What I finished. Let's continue. Another key word, this is about to blow your mind. Another key word in this is the host. Again, 6635. Uh, it means... <laughs> 
it's when you first come into it, it's going to say it's taken from 6633. And so when you're word studying, anytime you see anytime you see taken from, it means include that definition along with the one you're looking at. That's just for future purposes. But in this case, it means a mass of persons. Stay with me. This is what the word host means. It means an organized army of war by implication and campaign. It means a hardship, but it also means worship. It means an appointed time. I know you probably like, wait a minute, prophet, hold up. We're looking at the word host. That would it say, y'all. I, I just read it. We're looking up the word host from Genesis 2 and 1. All right, let me finish. It means an army, a battle, a company of hosts, service soldiers waiting upon war. This is why I get excited, y'all. Like a military, it is a symbol to fight, to perform, to muster, to wait upon war. It also means to wage war and it means to serve. Can I let, I'm getting excited. Let me stand up and be excited for a moment. I was a soldier. I don't walk around talk about I'm in the arm of the soldier of the Lord. I know why y'all say it, but I was a real soldier. Let me let me break down something I said. It says that um, it is what it, it's a hardship tour. Uh, when soldiers were stationed, um, I, I didn't ha I didn't go. I wanted to go, but not for the right reasons. There are what are called hardship tours, and and Korea is a hardship tour. Um, when you hear about North Korea, um, how do I want to say this? Mm, I, I'm gonna use this just for. Can y'all see that? Just for the the the, um, the the example. North Korea is here. South Korea is here. The DMZ is the borderline. The DMZ is just that wide, so it's guarded on both sides. So when you went to Korea, if you got orders to go to Korea, you were automatically told being the soldier, your family can't go. Send your kids somewhere with their dad or with the other parent or some grandparents because this tour is going to be a year to 18 months and you can bring no family because we cannot um, pro you know, uh, protect them. The base was about business. And the soldier needed to understand the significance of being stationed in South Korea. Because anything on South Korea, America, we were to guard it from the invasion of North Korea. Because it sends out an all-out war. So picture that, if, if you will. Because what God is saying here... And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to host with God, because there's two things he's mentioning. But let me say with the war part, what God is saying is <laughs> you were created in a hostile environment. And you're only going to be stationed here for a period of time. I need you to be on your guard. I need you to understand where you are. Because that was the important thing about that, that, that you knew you was in South Korea. You knew it was a hardship time. You knew you were going to be there for a set period of time. I'm afraid that we got this thing twisted and we think we're going to be here forever. <sighs> but it get better. Let me, let me put it all together for you. The beginning of the definition says, let me read it. <laughs> an organized war army implication of campaign uh in a, at, for an appointed time i'm sorry let me let me let, now let me put it together when you go back in genesis again you find out that he uses the word host again and it's the same definition that's why it works with the other one it means that the angels are included in the definition good and bad that means that good, the fallen, he, uh, he wasn't shocked. Those that remain, he wasn't shocked. But yet, though good and evil, a host, because that's what it's talking about, the host of angels, the host of fowls, all of it is in the word host. 
And now man is included in the word hoax. But when he says army, he's dealing with good and evil. But check this out. He said it was finished. What? He already saw the end of it. It doesn't matter when you were born. What matters is, are you able to recognize that you're here for a set period of time? How you handle the tour, how you handle it is important. The devil got us tricked thinking we're going to build houses and land and wealth and sit back and chill. Baby, you were born a prophet. In you is the very framework in the DNA of God to come down here and to do that which is a sign. But when you don't understand the framework i get that part and when you don't understand the reality of the time frame when you don't understand what he meant by it is finished then i then the problem is you are an open uh, a vulnerable soldier because you don't know how you fit you don't know where you belong you don't know how you belong. And when you lack the basic information, how you can call yourself a soldier in the army of the Lord. So as a regular soldier in the army, I understood. Or let me say it another way. I had to come to understand what it meant. So when I walk through the word of God, God has shown me, Sandy, I need them to understand. I got need of them. I want them to understand that I already saw them coming. They were already in the DNA of my mind and I already saw and knew where they were supposed to be placed. Now I need them to understand where they fit and how they belong. Let's continue. So now we had the word study that showed us what we needed to find out. And we have first mentions and then we had the day and time. The first mention is where, if you don't know, it's the first time you see a thing. And, and, and according to how we teach and how we roll, you know, that's my little ebonic thing. Uh, first mention means that the first time I see a thing in the Old Testament, oftentimes it keeps up that same definition or likelihood, making it a foreshadow of the new. So we didn't need to reinvent prophet in the New Testament because the foreshadow was still it. It still shined and shone and was introduced in the in the in the beginning, which is right here. So now, if you're coming in, um, you know, I I don't want to, you know, I know you're probably liking it so far, but I got to be honest with you. We went through the book of Jasher, and we had to do that because we wanted them to understand why God cut covenant with Abraham. He was over fifty years old by the time he got to Genesis twelve. Is a whole life you don't even understand that happened. So technically, and we, we're not even going to talk about Enoch, but I'm, I'm throwing these names out. So as we begin to walk through these, the lives of these prophets, we're going to go and pull out what they did and what they were known for. Why? Because it's the framework of your existence today as a prophet. The reason the devil is making you sleepy and don't want you to understand history, because if you ever understand history, you will understand that the framework of your existence was always in the DNA of God. And in the DNA of God was always in the word of God. And the word of God was always his testament to research who he was and how he moved and what he did. He was always the first mention of your existence. We just combine history to understand and we combine the culture of that day in history to help us to understand. Let's go. Now, it says, God took in order the beginning from the end, but he also is telling us uh, that we live in a hostile atmosphere, as I showed you. Um, but a military one, um, Genesis 24, 37 and 39, it says, for just like the days of Noah, i.e. just as, equal to, just as equal to the days of Noah, where so the so were, so the coming of the son of man will be, it's gonna happen that way. For in those days before the flood, Everybody should be jumping because y'all y'all been keeping up with me, right? You know what I'm going to say, right? Listen, for those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage 
until the day of Noah entered the ark. But when they knew nothing until the flood had came, snuck up on them, so will it be the same, the son of man. Now you're a prophet. And I know, I know, I know, right? Like they don't want you to think no more. They don't want you to comprehend. They don't want you to study because if you find out the truth of who you are, you find out how much authority you really got. And that's the thing the devil hates about the prophet. So now how were you talking about prophet? Check this out. If you believe the word of God to be the word of God. If you believe it. And I ain't making it up, right? Because you just read it. What, what did he mean it would be as in the days of Noah and before the flood? So if I was looking at the comment section, I'm going to tell y'all, tell me, tell me, y'all know the answer. He talking about Genesis 6. What happened before the flood, y'all? What happened before the flood was that the angels defiled the earth, possessed the men, had babies, the whole nine yards. I didn't, I didn't make this up. So let's go read it again. Cause you know, I, I don't want you to think I'm crazy. It said for just like the days of Noah, so just in case, you know, you may say, well, prophet, you got it wrong. Let's say the days of Noah. Da, da, da. Okay. Well, you do know that you do know that Noah was it. Okay. I'm going to shut up. In the, it says, for in those days before the flood, people was going on doing them, as we would say, a summation. They was doing them. But as a prophet, you must understand that all this demonic activity, so-called spaceships, these are nothing but hell. Listen, hell is agitated because he knows his time is short. Hell is agitated because he knows that he wants to keep you in a place of being blind, keep you in a place of uneasiness, questioning everything. Nothing is wrong with that. But when truth lands, let it land and open up your eyes so that your prophetic mindset will begin to open so that your prophetic framework can begin to take its shape and come into what God has for you. You got to stop sleeping, prophet. I don't care if everybody else go to sleep. You can't afford to. Let's continue. Now, 25, I, I just kind of mapped this out. Okay, so just, just stay with me. I said 25% expected, is expected, is, I'm sorry, 20, 25% uh, is not expecting Christ to come. 25% of the giants or gonna, in other words, like Noah's at this time, took the graph and broke it down because some people are visual. And then we have the we have the prophets existing, we have Christ coming, we have arcs being built, and we and Christ is the ark. So let's do it this way. In other words, what I'm saying is we're in the middle of the same thing happening as it was in that time. Christ is the only ark. It is the only ark of safety that needs to be built in the hearts and the minds of men. But how can they be built unless the prophet? Noah builds the ark, preaches the word, ministers, reaches, does with it, and then wakes up other prophets. If all that is coming and doing, the men, the giants will still sleep. Let me say it another way, because I'm going to take giant out and put it into its proper perspective. The demons will still be uh, possessing the people, and the people will still be sleeping with demons, producing little demons that will consume them and take them over. They will all be asleep until unsuddenly or suddenly the unexpected will happen, and the Son of Man will appear. It said, just like the days of Noah and the days before the flood. So he's leaving no misunderstanding to us that if you believe, you know, that to be the gospel that is, because if you believe it and you understand that he covered the giants, because in Genesis 6, it says that the giants were, and from that day forward would be, just as it said, so it was, and so it shall be. Let's continue. Let's go on. All right. Now, this is the part I like. This is the fun part. When I was taking uh, sociology and criminal justice, um, we had what was called empirical evidence. That means um, back up what you say. <laughs> and we had, in order to back up a theory or a hypothesis, we had to understand these terms. And so God told me to give it to you this way. So I pray this blesses your soul because it blessed me. So first of all, empirical evidence is the information obtained 
through observation and documentation of certain behavior and patterns or through an experiment. All right. A theory. A theory is a system of ideals intended to explain something, especially one based off general principles or independent principles of a thing that should be explained. In other words, prove it. Your theory is based upon questions that you have. Did it happen or did it not happen? If it did happen, prove it to me. Okay. So the empirical evidence is how we prove it. But then there's the hypothesis. Um, hypothesis is it is a supposition or proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence as a starting point for further investigation. So my hypothesis is I believe that this is true, but I don't really have enough evidence to prove it. So again, empirical evidence basically is the conclusion of whether it is a theory or a hypothesis. And so when we were, when I was in school, we had to understand it. Isn't it funny how people tell you, you know, girl, you don't need no education. And then if you get some, oh, you think you're so smart. No, fool, I'm just trying to understand Jesus. That's that what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to understand my assignment and, and I need to understand it. And don't let people make you feel bad because you decide you want to go to school at 40, 50 or 60. You just want to understand. I thought I'd throw that in there for free. <laughs> okay, we do some stuff. So now, I'm, I'm going back and forth. Christians, theory. Okay, I put you as theory, meaning that the principal form, you want us to explain the things that already exist in the data. If you say it exists, then prove it. So that's why I got Christian there. Unbeliever, I put hypothesis. It is an assumption made before any research really is done. It's a lot of questions. The word of God becomes your evidence. And as we seek out the testament, this helps to increase our belief in the empirical evidence provided. So I'm going to share this with you. Years ago, years ago, years ago, I was, I was it's years ago. And literally like 20 years ago, maybe more, but 20 at least. I remember sitting in um, higher dimensions at that time before everything went wrong. And I was in the, I were always, always worked in youth, always worked in youth. And so I remember one of the little boys got up and he raised his hand. Brian was his name, one, that's one of my spiritual sons. And I remember Brian asking a question. He said, the Muslim is saying, boom, 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 boom. And the, the the whoever was saying whatever, and yet we're saying that we believe in God. How am I supposed to know what's the truth? And I, you know, I, you know, I listen to me. Let me let me make this real clear. I wasn't nobody, y'all. I was just a little work leader that was faithful. I bounced between the children's church and that. Me and my husband did. Our family went there, and that's just what we did. But this particular day, I was working with the youth, and I was in there when Brian asked the question. And I remember doing this. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God help us. The reason was because Brian was just one of the, I got one of them sons, and they, our families were, were friends. So um, my head went down because I was like, oh, God, they're not ready for him. They're not ready for him. But his heart, if he asked it, it was for real. And many Christians say the same thing, and nobody really answers. We give you a scripture, but we don't really give you empirical evidence, right? So I watched them go through that a long time and everybody thought they had the best answer. And so one of the kids said, Miss Sandy, you're not going to say nothing. I said, yeah, I'm going to say something. So I waited. I said, God, give me what to say, not to be seen, so that the child will understand. And at the time, um, I was studying the word testament is why we're talking about this. So I want to tell you what testament means, but I'm going to answer it as I'm saying it, how I responded. I raised my hand up and I said, the Bible is a testament. A testament, when you go back and you look up the, 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 the definition, the testament was nothing more than a diary of the king's history. That's all it was. In the diary, if you wanted to learn about whatever king that reigned, it was all in his testament. Y'all hear me? What he's asking is a valid question. 
because he is the one being made to learn this from a child. Instead of giving him the answer, invite him to read the diary. No matter where you are and what age you are, read the diary. It is in the diary that as you begin to read it and as you begin to study it, you will come across what? The empirical evidence that holds true. For profit, I'm ready. Come on, let's, let's go here. Come on, let's go. Y'all ready? Here we go. Profit. The white man took the Bible. He did this to it. And the old books of the Bible ain't true. And whoa, 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 whoa. Let me slow you down. Okay. You ready? Here we go. If you were following our studies, I dealt with biblical history. The Bible was written. The Bible, the Old Testament kind of was written like something like a 1340 BC. That's the Old Testament. They had to canonize it. Canon means a measuring rod. Enoch was in the original Bible. I'll, this is before Christ came now. So a lot of the stuff that, that they took out was in the original Bible. By 1340, okay, let's back up. I'm, I'm skip. Christ comes along. Uh, Christ dies about 90 AD, okay? The first Bible that we want to speak of was written kind of really about... 190 or about 90 between 90 and 120 AD that because the old testament was already done we're just adding now the new testament but we're not really adding the new testament we're just taking all the works of christ and the apostles and we're confining them into a book that existed by 90 AD in that time frame you had uh hermes i believe it's h-e-m um, b-r-e-s you had constantine where you get the apostles creed from you had the major one was the Council of Lacedia. And the Council of Lacedia was the one that had various, it was made up of something like 30 to 300 bishops from all around the world. They decided what was acceptable and what was not. And yes, the Roman Catholic Church was in it as well. So, in fact, Enoch was welcome the whole time. And now y'all acting like Enoch ain't real because you don't know your history. They decided what was beneficial for the people and what was not. But history can never, real history can never be laid or buried to sleep. It'll always come up. All right. So, so that's AD. I didn't forget where I was. At 1340, we have the first English Bible or translated into the first English Bible by Wycliffe. By 1611, y'all about to get mad at a sister. By 1611, we have the first Bible that is now broken into Old Testament and New Testament. But prior to that, it was just one Testament. So when you go to the, when you look in the Catholic Bible, they have the Maccabees, they have the Tobot, they have all the ones that we were, and I'm, I'm listening to y'all argue, and I'm saying, but all y'all wrong. Just go to history. So when you say to me, oh, let me finish. Um, Joshua was the verse. I don't have to talk my head. Joshua stops the sun. It's in the Old Testament, right? Where the rest of the story at? Why he stopped the sun? There are 14 books. Enoch is one. Joshua is one. Um, Enoch, Joshua, Solomon, because the Bible mentions that, the, that matter of fact, the Bible mentions that the rest of this is written in the Testament of Solomon. Gad talks about Gad in, uh, it's right there. Your name is right. Nathan, all of them have books and the Bible mentions their books, but because the council of Lacedia at the different times and increments decided that they were not a couple. We jumping up talking about this is all we got is the 66 books because Jesus knew Jesus ain't had nothing to do with these books. I'm sorry. Man did this. Let me stay with you. I ain't done. Well, prophet, and what about the slavery book? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Thanks for reminding me. Check this out. So what had happened was the, 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 the doctrine of discovery 
existed. The Doctrine of Discovery said, the, it, it goes back to 1493. The Doctrine of Discovery basically gave the legal right to go into whatever country in the name of God and take the people in the white race was supposed to be the only race that was in charge. And they indentured slaves and killed off the Native Americans. So when they got the Native Americans, what they did here, they assimilated them and they told them, you need to dress like us, put away your, your, your tambourines, your feathers, and stop jumping around and be civil. Assimilation. The slavery, they brought us here, our people here, ancestors here, and then they did the same thing to us and assimilated us, assimilated, inserted us, made us learn their system. But before they didn't really like, that was before freedom. Let me back up. But that was before freedom. They took the Bible and it is in, I think I played it on one of my shows, not here, but one of my other shows and showed them what the slave Bible looked like. They took out all of the Old Testament. They took out over half anything that said freedom and one person under God or, or God so loved the world and died for everybody. All that was taken out and they created the slave Bible that made them stay indentured and enslaved to them in the name of God. So I want to be clear here. When people tell me, you believe in the white man's God, fool, let me tell you something. If y'all knew where I come from, you would be glad I believe in anything. I'll be honest with you because that's how wretched I was. But no, I fell in love with the God, a God, the God, Jehovah, Yahweh, Jehovah Rapha, uh, whatever, whatever name you want to call him. I want you to understand that there is only one true and living God. I am that I am is real. And that God, I got to know from, from my street life, because he had to reveal himself to me, because don't nobody walk away from that kind of stuff that easy. And I had to learn of him. So the reason I have a heart for prophets is because I know what it's like to come in, find out that you got a calling you don't know nothing about, then try to figure out who you are, let alone what you're supposed to do. I don't have time for game and hustle. But I also, God also made me be educated. And I ain't talking about school because he wouldn't let me go to school. I had to learn his word. I had to stay with his word. I had to stay in his word because God wanted me to understand you can't be out here in these streets representing me and looking crazy. I need you to know why you believe what you believe. I need you to be able to prove what you're saying. So I'm taking the time out to summarize a whole lot of stuff in, in a sense of saying, I understand what God is talking about, about the framework. You are called to something bigger than you. And God wants to educate you. And I know we live in a generation of microwavable theologies and religions, but I don't serve a God that does anything quick because remember he said it was finished and then he backed up in time and then began time after he finished time. Who do that? Who finished time, it is finished, considered everything that was going to go wrong. Nothing got him by surprise, signed his name, put a seal on it, chill back and relax, and then turn around and say, now let's go. That's the God I want to know. That's the God I came after on this walk. Amen. So I'm saying all that to say that, um, now let me, let me say this as a precursor. I did not jump up and read all of the lost books of the Bible. I only read them and have read them as God told me to and in time, because I'm going to be honest, there's some stuff I know y'all ain't ready. That's why I don't advocate it. I, like I have certain ones I'll say, I'm going to say stay with Jasher because it confirms everything in Genesis and in the Old Testament. You can't go wrong. And that's why it's mentioned in the Bible. That's why the Bible says it's in the book of Jasher. If the Bible refers something, why wouldn't you read it? Now, here's why I'm saying that. If, if, the, if we tell the story of Joshua and it says, but the rest of the story is in the book of Jasher, do you think that um, it may, kind of, let me demonstrate another way. Are you going to go buy a whole book over one quote? So we're going to take the one quote out of the book, stick it over here, and then call this the gospel. Yeah, so God don't have no good sense. No, men did this. And we have to, again, put things into perspective. And, and even if you're wrong, the Holy Ghost, I know, will check and correct you. Is that all right? So I just want to say that, that again, getting to know the Testament and understanding history. That's why I'm, I'm a history freak. And I ain't been to school for history. I just love history. All right, let's continue. So we talked about the Navi. Okay, we uh, just for a recap, um, we talked about the seer. Now, here we go. Let's get into this. Let's get into the next phase of this. Say this word with me. I'm a bright child, but I mess it up every time. 
plenty potentiary or plant, but it's the E, plenty potentiary or plant a potentiary. It means a person, especially a diplomat, invested. So we have a person who is a, who is a possibly a diplomat or ambassador that is invested with the full power of independent action of uh, on behalf of their government, typically a foreign government. Plant a potentiary. It is a person, a diplomat who is invested with full power of independent action. Um, let me let me tell you this little story because I told y'all I was going to tell some of the people I set up under. I got I got saved. Uh huh. And so we were stationed in Germany. And my first school of the prophets was in Germany about probably 1992, 93. Two year time frame. Um, I set up under his name is Bob Godwin. Um, he we were soldiers, so we were stationed there and his school was there. I attended a school of 144 different nationalities. My teacher's name was Alan, who was a white guy, but he was married to a Philippine. I don't even remember her name. But the whole school was made up of foreigners, okay? And I didn't, I didn't know I was sitting in the middle of history. Like, I didn't know. You know what I mean? Like, I was just trying not to beat up folk at church and looked at me crazy because, you know, that Philly was still running in my veins. And so... Um, I sat there for two years, went through the school. And I remember when I, gra I love to tell this story. When I graduated, Bob Godwin came up because, you know, you know, he would come up certain times of the year because the whole school was his and it was big. 144. It was in Frankfurt, Germany. It was phenomenal. And, and I'm not talking about Rick Godwin. So that's not who I said. I know who Rick is with the big eyebrows. That's not who I'm talking about. And so I remember he came and, you know, we didn't know him. So we, we couldn't do the ooh and ah thing, you know. So, so toward the end of the graduation, um, uh, the founder, Godwin, came up and he ministered and prophesied to everybody. And he looked at me and he said, I want you to understand something. You have to be careful when you're mad what you speak because you hold too much authority in your mouth. Baby, I had just found out I was a prophet within that two-year period at school. <laughs> so I heard my spirit heard what he said. I had only been saved at that time, maybe like five years. So we're talking about like 1990 something. And here I was and I'm, I'm finding out I'm the prophet and I don't know nothing about what I'm supposed to do, you know? And I'm being told with so much sternness and love, shut up when you get mad. You're talking reckless. So we, were, we stayed there until about... Um, 95, 96, we came back to Fort Raleigh, Kansas, because we were still in the military, set up under Bishop Mary Polk. And I, I've always been an honor bearer. Didn't know what God was doing. I'm talking to prophets. You're trying to figure out why God put you in certain positions and why God has you doing certain things. And he doesn't always explain. So I'm hoping that what I'm saying is helping you. And so first I was in the nursery. You know how that go. But I love kids, so it wasn't a big deal to me. But I, I, I'm this, and let me say, before we went to Germany, we were already at this particular deliverance ministry because that's where I got my deliverance from. So now uh, it's four years later um, and I'm back again, or let me say five years later and I'm back again. And so this time um, the pastor calls me up and, um, you know, I'm more mature, got my relationship together. And she says, God says, he's not finished with you yet. And she made me one of her armor bearers because she had a lot of them. It was a pretty big church. And so I, I wrote it out. I did whatever. I stayed there. And then about 1998, uh, me and our family, we got the call of God to go attend um, Prophetess Pam Burnett School of the Prophets in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's the first time I said her name in a long time. Um, and it's good. Uh, so we went there. I didn't know Prophetess Burnett. I didn't know anything about Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had went down there for an Azusa conference because, you know, like I want you to understand something. Military is a different world. Um, I, I wasn't into conferences and jumping here. I had four kids that I was homeschooling. I had a husband that I was taking care of. Hello. All of this was a full time job. So running the streets and all that wasn't it. But my relationship with God was always solid. I'm going somewhere. Just stay with me. And so when God told us to move to Tulsa to go to the school of the prophets, I was like, but I already been to one of them. You know, I'm stupid. I already been to one school of the prophets. Why do you want me to go to another one? He said, because there's something else I need you to learn. I said, okay. So we go to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and immediately I go 
to higher dimensions because she was a house prophet for higher dimensions. And I sat where I was supposed to sit. And um, so then, of course, we were ready for school. I was in, um, my husband didn't go the first year, but I did. And by the time I got into my second year, he was into the first year. But nonetheless, we set where our mentor was. I knew she was a mentor to me. I knew um, that I had to eat from, from what she was given. And at the time, I wound up, actually, uh, God told me to armor bear her. And this is what I said. I was like, because, I mean, higher dimensions was bigger than where we had come from. Tulsa was a different level. Um, not where we were wasn't small, but Tulsa was bigger, if that makes any sense. And so I remember um, God telling me, I need you to armor bear her. And I was like, who am I? I mean, I'm looking to listen, y'all. I'm talking about Mark Sharona was passing through there. Um, oh, what's his name? My, Raphael Green. Uh, oh God, it was so many names of that era that was coming. Everybody was coming through higher dimensions, i.e. Azusa. So you've seen all the stuff on Azusa. You know what I'm talking about, right? So we knew, we, I'm green. And I, I mean, cause I, and I knew she was a house prophet. So who was little on me? Come to find out I live literally right across the street, away, rather. So here's the street. I'm on this side, she on that side. And God says, I want you to armor bear her. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not telling that woman nothing. Like if you want me to armor bear her, uh, you just need to uh, tell her and then she tell me and go from there. That's that's a whole other story. But I went through that and got what my behind. That's we'll just put a period there. Make a long story short. I put it off for like about two weeks, the first two weeks of school. And this one day I was in my home and I had a dream. And in the dream, I was. Um, first, I was on my knees. I was praying. I'm sorry. She was praying on her knees and she was like at the feet of Christ. And I was standing like here watching it. And as I was watching it, I remember saying, yeah, I want to be on that level with you. And the moment I said that, I remember he looked over at me and I literally went into his eyes. When I went into his eyes, I came out and I could see her walking. And it's like, I'm, it's like, I'm here. She's here, but she's on a hill. Or incline. And so she's walking. I'm running, trying to catch up. And the more I try to get to her, I can't. By the time I get to where she is, a demon is here. It rips in, it reaches in, and it pulls her heart out. And I was left there crying. You must say, well, crying for what? Because what God was showing me is if you don't take your place, she'll die. I was like, but how is serving going to do anything? That's not for you to answer. Your job is to obey. I didn't, I ain't been, I haven't, I wasn't at no serving school again, why I have compassion for prophets. And I remember going to her feeling like nobody, you know, like I wasn't nobody. And I said, God told me I needed to serve you. I'm going to let you pray about it. However you want me to do it and just tell me what, cause I didn't know. And from that time on, for the next three years, I would drive. I, listen, I was homeschooled. I homeschooled all four of my kids. I wrote the curriculum. I got up and taught it, took care of my household and my husband and still went to church and still went to school. And now I was her chauffeur from 12 to 4 every single day. Had to be home by five to make sure that the meal was cor correct. Don't tell me about not being a servant. Don't ever question my servitude because you don't know my, my resume. So, as and I'm going somewhere, as things went on, uh, Paula Price, Dr. Paula Price, the book of uh, Prophet's Dictionary, um, she was living in Jersey at the time, and she wound up coming there, I guess it was about 2000, 2001, somewhere in there. And so, because Pam was teaching from her book, we wanted to get that teaching straight from her mouth. So Dr. Paula Price had some, it began on Friday night. She still do it to this day, I think. Friday night, something she still do. She just does it live. But we were there in the room where there were no cameras and no cell phones. And we were eating from her mouth. The first prophet's book was 125 pages long. And we were the, we were the students that sat back there. And we did them little machines. You have to know what I'm talking about. The spiral machine that you do for the book. We sat there and we put the work in to help the woman of God. We did this. That was the first time that I realized I, even though I was sitting, so sitting up under a uh, prophetess, Vinette, um, Dr. Uh, Price was writing stuff like this word, plantable temporary, and we couldn't even say it. 
And she was teaching us what it meant to walk in the office of a prophet. The terminology changes, the responsibility changes. And so I'm adamant on this thing, but I didn't want to just talk to you about this because this word, you can find it in the dictionary, but I want you to understand that we learned this word through toiling and trial and servitude. I don't stand as no novice because you don't know my name don't mean it don't exist. This right here is why I do what I do. Because this word gives a command and a response that I want you to take to heart. Let's continue. It is a diplomat, a diplomat represents an agency or organization who invested its power and authority into a diplomat to represent them. Dr. Paula Price says that this way, an agency is a source an official entity that administ administrates and executes the duties and the responsibilities associated with a delegation, usually called a commission. Commissions are used as a type of order to be carried out, but the word official is what is key. Y'all with me? All right, let's keep going. The, the 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 source is a it is a governing so uh, so we so now I'm shifting the terminology a little bit source it is a governing in other words who gave you that governing power a source gave you that i.e an agency so an agency it is a governing force or a governing source which means this it is this source God that is not only the sender of the authority. I want to slow this down because I want to go back. Just stay with me. All right. I want to go back. So let's go back. A diplomat. All right. So it is the diplomat that represents the agency or organization who is investing. All right. It is the diplomat basically who gets its source. I'm sorry. Who gets its power from a higher source. You following me? So the agency is the source. The diplomat works for the source, which is the agency, and that's where they get their power from. Now, let's keep going. It is the source, meaning God, that is not only the sender of all authority, but the, re the releaser of authority. Who stands beside their agents? Who stands beside his women and men of God, both in authority and out? who fall or work under their agency. Isaiah 6 and 8, we're about to go there, but hang on, let me finish this. Thus, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, we, we have the Great Commission. So you can go back. I didn't want to put that on here, but we have the Great Commission that, we're, that, that is mentioned there. But I want to go ahead and I want to go to Isaiah 6 and 9. I'm sorry, 6, 8 through 9. And it reads as such. I got all these little tablets on here, but we'll go over that later. Let me read the scripture first. It says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Notice that it's in red. Then it says, then I said, here am I, send me. And then number nine says, and he said, go and tell this people Keep on hearing, but do not basically talk to the people that keep hearing, but do not understand. They keep seeing and do not perceive. So this is where we're going to slow it down in this verse. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying this phrase. I have it labeled. The call goes out. God is looking. Many are called, but few are what? You got it. Next, and who will go for us? We got to stay right there, but we're going to come back. Well, no, we, we can stay there. The us is who will go to represent us. What is the us? The agency. Plant table tenturary. Us is eternity. Us is God. Us is the source. Us is the agency. Who will go and represent us? Hold on. Can you go? I'm talking to my child for a minute. Do me a favor and go, go get me one of my books. 
and the, they, they right there in the closet on the side. Either bring me the book or book out of there or a shirt out of the bag in the closet and bring it here. Mm-hmm. I, I, I got a multitask. So who will go and represent us? We got to stop here. We, 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 we got to, y'all. God is not looking for you to represent you. God is not looking for you to be about your business in his name. He's looking for you to represent him about his business and walk in his name. Any other name ain't God. I, I, you got to pray for me because I know I got the problem. I know it ain't you. I know it ain't you. Your brand. Your brand. Well, God gave it to me. I, I get that. I, I'm going to get there. It's okay. I ain't knocking it, but what about his brand? That's to us. Who will go and represent us, his brand? I know your name. I see it everywhere. But all he's saying is, I'm looking for somebody to represent me. I, I, here, here we go. So, so, so in our school, thank you. In our school, you, when you come into you, one of our students, you have to get this book. It's, I wrote it. I'm not advertising either. So don't worry about that. Prophetic fidelity. This is the soft back. So it's about 120 pages. Prophetic fidelity. And it says, Restoring prophetic integrity for the next generation unafraid. When 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 sportsmen sign up, Jordan, uh, LeBron, whoever, they have to sign a type of disclosure saying that, in other words, if Nike, Nike is saying, look, Jordan, I'm going, I'm, I'm a sign you. I see where you're going. I see your potential. Y'all call it favor. I'm not, it is, it is what it is. But before we sign you, we have some stipulations that we need you to keep called fidelity. Fidelity means that I need you to rep the brand. Come on, somebody. It means that where Nike is signing you because Nike is the source. Nike is the agency that your life is about to represent. And I need your life to be conducive to the fidelity by which we stand. I know that's sexy. Because that's how God gave it to me. Because he's sexy. He said, y'all repping me? Where is your fidelity? By, by that? In other words, where can they see my fidelity in you? Can they see my brand in spite of your brand? Fidelity means this. You maintain the same integrity. You maintain the same standard of excellence that the source, the agency has placed in your hands. So God is saying, who will go and rep my brand? Let's go on. I'm not going to continue to the next part of the sentence I meant. He says, and, and, and uh, the prophet's response is, here am I, which is the right answer, send me. Verse 9 says what? And he said, go and tell this people, that's the orders, all right? So if you're, that's the orders. And then the mission is, uh, tell this people um, who do not understand, who keep on seeing but perceive not. God is saying to the prophets of God, I want you to accept all of the orders, not the part that feels good, not the part that makes you popular or comfortable, but, but there is a mission that the prophet has on the earth. And I'm setting the framework for you to understand the magnitude by what I am calling you to do. Listen, plant potentiary prophets, you are plant potentiaries. That means that you represent an agency. Notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying good or bad, right? I'm going somewhere. I'm going to try to wrap it up because I can, I can continue next week. I'm not saying good or bad because that's not where we are. I'm telling you the source of it all. Well, prophet, how you going? 
I'm glad you asked this question. I was I was prepared. Prophet, how can you say that all prophets, good, bad, indifferent, or whatever, all come from God? Because he the source. He said in Genesis 2 and 1, it's finished. What part didn't you understand, boo? He didn't separate good and bad. He said, it's finished. And I put you in what? A hostile environment. So now that you're in the environment, you got to choose whose side you're on. But remember the word Nabi or Nabi, the, 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 the Greek, I'm sorry, the Hebrew word for prophet is what? A spokesman. And it said what? They can be good or bad. That's what it said, right? Now let's go. Let's continue and see how much time I got. So we're just going to, so recapping the governing powers, uh, Matthew, of course, you can read that. We had the sender. The sender is the source of the agency. The releaser is the source and the agency. The sustainer is the source and the agency. We can do nothing unless God does it. And you can read Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I'm not going to read that for the sake of time, but of course you understand about the agency. Now let's go ahead and deal with this. And then I think I'm going to stop it here. It's, uh, uh, it's only been a little over an hour, but I'm gonna. <laughs> I can go long. I'm sorry. Let me go ahead and wrap it up here. Let's deal with this. We are uh, a part of. We're a part. Should be where. Apologize for the typo. We are a part of a greater mission. The fivefold. Um, in Ephesians uh, four eleven and twelve, it says, "So Christ Himself gave apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teachers, and some pastors and teachers. I'm sorry for the equipment of the saints." for the working of the service of the building up of the body of Christ. So what's the commission for the, what's the, what's the commission out of the, out of the scripture I'm saying, what's the commission. So remember there's the mission, all right? But the commission is the work, the work. What is the work? The equipping of the saints for what purpose? Cause anytime there's a mission, there's gotta be a purpose. They have to match for the working of the service. Returning the hearts back to God. That's what it's about. I'm not done. Um, so what is a governing authority? You already know that it is God. So now, hold on. Let me, let me see how far I got. Okay. I can't get to it today. Oh, I want to get to it today. I'm trying. I want to because oh, I got to show y'all. Can, can I? Can I, Jesus? All right, let's do this part. The prophetic is an agency unto itself. In other words, think of think of God. We just talked about rep the brand, right? So we got God, eternity as a source or the agency. He's talking to Isaiah in, in Isaiah, uh, uh, Isaiah 6, right? He tells him who will go for us. So he's asking Isaiah and, and us to rep or to represent him. So Isaiah takes the charge. Noah took the charge. Your yes means yes, you accept the charge. As you accept that charge, he now is looking for you to implement what? The fidelity of the kingdom or the fidelity of heaven. Let me keep reading. The prophetic is the agency unto itself, no different than any other. But like any other agency, the prophetic has its own mission statement. Thus, as we just read, the global mission is for the equipping of the saints, but in it, it, the equipping of the saints to bring that which is needed for the building up and the edification of the saints. But as we saw last week, the eternal mission is to return the heart of creation back to a place of theocracy. So if you've been keeping up with me, this is going to make sense. We talked, we, I'm sweating. We talked about um, how we got from Genesis 6 and how we went through the flood and how the giants were still here after Genesis flood. And we went through all the history. And now we have the Tower of Babel, which was not before the flood, but after the flood, which meant that when they was all dispersed, it was then that the prophetic was uh, really, really dispersed even the more because sin was dispersed even the more and whatnot. So the thing about it is the arise of Abraham was not just so he could say he was a prophet. It was to tear down 
everything. Well, where do we get our authority from? You got to go back to Genesis 1 and 26 and 28, where he says, and I made them in my image. In, in my image, I made them and I gave them power to subdue, to overturn. All, we're going we're gonna to come back to this because this is called the Shamar anointing, to cause things to subjugate, to bow down, to, de- to be dethroned. Your original authority before Christ ever came is still locked in lodge in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And then when you go to Genesis, I believe it is, was it 9 and 2, 9 and 3? We found out that even after Adam and Eve were kicked out, he makes this strange insertion. And that insertion, I believe Genesis 9 and 2, 9 and 3, it says, and I, listen, he repeats, he reiterates Genesis 1, 26 and 28, but it throws in one stipulation. And, it, and go read it for yourself. It says, and I will cause men to fear you. We're so busy talking about what they did that we're not talking about that he didn't strip them of their authority. It was the enemy that comes to tell you what you are not. God didn't take no authority away from them. In fact, that one verse that says, and and, and they will look on you and fear you, all the creatures of the earth. Do you understand that by you just walking in the fidelity of God, knowing who you are, a demon will think twice before they run up in your face. I'm not saying you ain't gonna never have no problems, but your presence, it causes the enemy to think twice or don't run up so easily without a plan. Let's get back to this. So here we have um, the, the overall mission is to return. That's why I did that. It's, I said all of that was to return the, the earth back to a theocracy, meaning God is the one that's in control. Let's keep going. Now, this is my part right here. Just as the USA has several branches of the military, so is it just like in God. But they all cover all a basis of the region, the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Space Force. The Navy can be equated, listen to this, the Navy can be equated with the Apostle or the Apollos. Why? I probably didn't put that in here, so let me read what I got first. <laughs> let me read this first. The prophets, the Air Force, or uh, or the Marines, the Army as the pastors, the teachers, and the evangelists, the Coast Guard, services, etc., However, what is key is that they all bring a different level of tactics of diversity to the table. Oh, God. Now, let me go back before I, before I go off. Not off, but before I go there. And I'm going to stop it after I say this because I ain't going to get off here if I don't. I was in the Army. So when we went to war, everybody came. It wasn't just about the Army. And, the, and like every individual branch has generals, captains, sergeants, and everybody think they, they it. <laughs> yeah, we thought the Marines was it, you know, but that's another conversation. But the point in the Air Force, Air Force are always known as being logical, logistically in tune. You know, they they, they know how to read the sky. They Everybody has your own individual a reason of, of for existence and understanding why you join a thing, which I didn't understand none of that. I had to figure it out when I was in there and it happened. You know, you don't know why you just, you just do it. But nonetheless, when we went to an all out war campaign, whether it was now or then Afghanistan, Ukraine, they send you over. Um, they take some from every branch because some from every branch has um, particular skills and tactics and things that they bring to the table. And it's, you know, you don't hear nobody saying, girl, I, I ain't sitting by, I ain't sitting by that uh, Navy person up over there. Mm-mm, I, don't, mm, I don't like them fool. You better get up over there by that Navy person because that Navy person might be the friend you need to bring you up out of a, uh, a hold. I don't like the Marines. Look at them. They think they better. They think they bad. Child, that Marine might save your life because they'll cut somebody's throat and don't even think twice. Why we don't think like that? Why, why do we got to get up and, and I got to put you against you when you got to put me against somebody or you want to make everybody hate me because I corrected you or check you? Why do we do the bickering? Because you don't really believe that you're in the army of God. Isn't it funny how the Bible says that uh, Satan's kingdom is not divided, but he doesn't say it's not divided in our kingdom. When they come together as a unit, we show up as a unit. And I'm not going to say there ain't no isms and schisms because we got friendly fire. Friendly fire is when you get shot by your own people. That's real. But what I am saying is that the mission is bigger. 
than you. You, you know what we got in common? Everybody's trying to get home to their kids, their husband, and their wives. Ain't nobody got time for this. If I spend all my time. Okay. Oh, God. If I spend my time trying to hunt down every lie that the leader said about me. If I spend my time trying to explain every misunderstanding that I didn't even know was a misunderstanding because, I mean, I said it in love. I told you I didn't mean no harm and it wasn't anything personal. I even apologized like 50 times and you still holding on to it. That's not my problem. Listen, if we didn't learn nothing else today, we learned according to Genesis 2 and 1, we are in a hostile environment called Earth. It is important that I become equipped to survive Earth, which means their inhabitants. It is important that I stay equipped in my mind to handle all the adversity that's coming my way. And if I do happen to come in contact with other people that are up, supposed to be like me, professing like me and tripping and crazy, I got to know how to deactivate them in peace and keep stepping. But I'm not responsible for your ignorance for your attitude. I'm not responsible because you think something about me or you think, oh, how, how they do that? I think she don't like me. I'm not responsible for that. Cause in my mind, everybody know me? Anybody that set up under my school, this is probably one of my, my go-tos and it's this. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to understand. You can hear all this discernment for everybody else you can see the devil coming for everybody else and you can't see that demon on your shoulder that's my go to because sometimes you got to go in the room by yourself and say is my spirit right Jesus am I tripping well God showed me they didn't like me okay so again remember we talked about earlier we're going to work on this progress we're going to work on this swap because I'm trying to help you I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shooting shots. I don't throw shade. I'm, I'm serious because I was immature once and I thought everybody didn't like me <laughs> and they probably didn't. But the problem was I wasn't responsible for how they thought I was responsible about how God saw me. And even if they didn't me walking around as the victim thinking everybody doesn't like me, I needed to get delivered because the truth of the matter is demons don't like me because I was a prophet. I just didn't know who I was. So because I didn't know who I was, the devil was using mind games to play on me, even if he was using other people. And when we get to germ warfare, we'll talk about that. All right. But the gist of it is, is the fact that this is why we can't work together, because we always say stuff like I think he don't listen. I discern her spirit. Her spirit ain't right. Well, wait a minute, baby. I mean, OK, let, let's let's what is the basis framework? Framework, right? Got to have framework. What's the framework of your basis? Okay, you got a theory and possibly a hypothesis, but how have you proven that to be true? Well, God told me. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. So let me see if I got this right. So God told you that my spirit was off. And, and why he say that? Because I need you to back up scripture. I need you to prove your hypothesis or your theory. Or you a lying wonder. That one, I'm going to flip out. But right now, I ain't flipping. So I need to understand, how did you calculate that I'm a witch or a psychic? Because I need empirical evidence. Because his word say that there's no confusion. His word say, put away strife and rivalries. His word is a fidelity by which I live and profess what have you seen me do that you're doing that? Well, you know, I heard, wait a minute, hold up. But is it, that, that don't sound like empirical evidence to me. That sounds like some foolishness. Well, you know, somebody told me, she, okay, you saw it? So you was there. You was in the company when it happened? Well, no, but I just believed him because it was the leader. Oh, so leaders don't lie. Y'all gonna stop playing with me. 
So let me tell you, and I, I'm segueing. This is going. I'm, I'm bringing it together. I was so excited this morning when I saw my cover was finished. Right? Let me tell you why. Because my grandbaby deleted all my stuff for the cover. <laughs> I'm talking about the name of it and everything. So I had, and I couldn't remember it. So I had to go back and be like, okay, God, let's try this one more time. And I, I knew most of it, but it was a subtitle. So he said, I want you to put this for the subtitle. Preparing, let me get it right. Mm. Reducing prophetic casualties. I thought it was sexy too. Pro Listen, reducing prophetic casualties. <laughs> and the Holy Ghost was so crystal clear. He says, Sandy, the reason I got you on this journey for one year to teach prophets is because they are dying by friendly fire, which means other people tearing you down and you getting discouraged and you abandoning your mission because nobody told you that you're not supposed to abandon your mission. But you, you come up with the right drill, Sergeant. I stay with me long enough. I'll, I'll make you feel, think you can walk on water and you will do it because I, it's my DNA. The other way is spiritual suicide. You just give up. Nobody killed you. You blame other people for killing you. But what really killed you was discouragement. We're losing profits and they're becoming casualties of war. Self-inflicted injuries, friendly fire, or POWs, which is prisoners of war, or MIAs, which is missing in action. And we got to deal with this. Now, here's what's funny. I, I, I'm talking about the Army, the Air Force, the Navy. Oh, I'll finish it. The Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. And we all coming together to go into battle. All these wounded people going on the battle at one time. Don't you know the devil can smell your blood? He can smell your bleeding. He can smell your hemorrhaging. And you are an open target to be attacked. Well, I'm going on the battlefield like this because God told me to come as you are. God ain't told you to go on the battlefield like that, boo. God told you to come as you are to him. He did not tell you to get on the battlefield and go to war. That's why God is saying, Sandy, I want to heal them from the inside out. I want them to know that I'm not judging them. I'm not beating you up. I'm not tearing you down. I'm exposing your pain because I want to heal it. And I got so much I got for you, but the voices in your head keep telling you I'm going to throw you away. I don't throw away my creation. I, I'm the potter. I just smash it down and make it again another vessel. In the Navy, I, I started out saying that they're what's called the Apollos because in the Navy, um, they're known uh, 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 apostles. That's where we get the word apostle from or Apollos. They were in charge of fleets of ships. That's why when I came up, when I was going down the list about apostles, I use the word Apollo. So I'm, I'm, I'm tying it up this way because I want you to understand something. I understand that it is a great responsibility to be sitting in the apostolic office and being assigned fleets of souls to deal with and to work with. And you need help. And you need some prophets, the Air Force, that can see what you can. And, and, and the Air Force is so diverse. You have the uh, logistics and then you have the operations and then you have the maneuvers and then you have the Marine who has better maneuvers than them. You need a mixture of all these other people to help you carry the weight of the fleets. You can't run the daggone ship by yourself, Apollos. But you need some healed people. And you need those that are going to serve. Not certain. Let me let me let, let's throw this in here real quick. Remember, I, I use the example of, of serving Apostle Vanette because of the reason that it wasn't about carrying her briefcase. But what people didn't know was that every night I laid down to pray for my own family and kids, I had to pray for hers. 
What people didn't know was that there were many times where, and she did not know how to drive. So I drove her everywhere and couldn't ask for a dime of gas. Couldn't expect anything. I didn't expect a pat on the back. I did not expect anything because it was my assignment. And God was the source of the pain. But I had to treat her family like mine. I had to keep the fidelity of what was being asked. God puts us through things so that I needed to, uh, uh, and our real armor bearer will make the way easy on the apostle. Why do I have to tell you to pray for me? There were times I was just, I knew she liked something or her husband liked something. I just go get it. And Bishop Mary, that probably was a little bit more. Um, I did a lot of that for them. He wasn't a speaker. He was the co-pastor. But nonetheless, it would be nothing to go send something to Bishop Mary and then something to her husband because I knew what they liked. I didn't wait to do it. I didn't present it in a bag in front of the church. I didn't do something different for anniversary or for the church anniversary. My servitude was consistent all the way through. It just was what it was. Your servitude is supposed to make the weight light for your pastor. And if you're in a position, you might say, well, prophet, apostle, I ain't serving nobody right now. I'm in the house. Let God keep feeding you in the house and keep eating so he can build you up for the next assignment. Yeah, we're going to talk about that too, but that's another thing. So I'm saying all this to say that what you should have gotten out of today, and that is the fact that you are a diplomat and ambassador of the kingdom of God. And like Isaiah, you represent the kingdom of God. But you must make sure you walk with the right fidelity of the kingdom. And again, we're talking about framework and we're not done. So I hope that what I said bless you. I hope that you got something from it. Go back on uh, YouTube or whatever and get this stuff and, and, and just <laughs> feed your soul. If you can learn to be an individual and block out the hey say, the nay say, the haters, the bike biters, and everything else, it is what it is. Now, let me say this before I close. I don't give out my resume. I never have. Today is probably the first time in a long time that you heard me use the names. How did it end, Prophet? Wait, I'll tell you on the journey. If you want to run ahead, whatever you get, you run into. You on your own. If you want to wait, I'm an open book. I ain't no line in my gut. I ain't no line in my DNA. But I got to do this because I'm talking to real prophets who got to walk this thing out in real life. And we got to stop lying to you, telling you that everything going to be all right and everything going to go right. But what God wants you to understand, I got you. And that right there is all that matters. And if you are God prophet, meaning God got his hand on you, you can never be put to shame. Is that all right? Father God, I think and I praise you. I bless your name for being God. They don't even know, do they? They don't know my relationship with you, only what they can gauge. And I don't know their relationship with you, only what I can gauge. But the truth be told, you know how much I need you. Probably just as much as they need you. So Holy Ghost, go where my words end. Go where this session ends and minister to the hearts of your people. The journey is great ahead. Prepare us. Put a hedge of protection around them in this season that they're eating and eating and consuming and digesting and studying and eating and consuming and digesting and dreaming and feeling and growing and sprouting their wings to fly. Put a season around them where they will not have to deal with the diversity right now. As you always do, you prepare us for the battle before the battle comes. Let them understand that and submit to the process. Because when the season ends, battle will be required. And if I'm going to give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you for tuning in. I did not um I get you know I forget I don't be asking for the offer. What is it? But if you want to send something, you can. We have um, a place for you to do that. Yes, we are a real church. Yes, we are, but we're doing it the way God said to do it. Um, God said that this bill was on him. It was for prophets that were hungry and that wanted to eat. Um, that's why uh, I, I don't do all that money stuff. And I'm not finna give you no word and prophesy no word to make you feel good. And you need to repent anyway. Let me shut up. Happy Remembrance Day, i.e. Resurrection Day. If you want to give something, text GIVE, G-I-V-E, to 866 866- 863-2435. If not, take that money and go bless somebody. Go get somebody a meal. Go give it to the homeless. I'm good. Hear me? I ain't got no greed here. But just go do something different. With that being said, I am Apostle Sandy Love. Have a blessed day. God bless you.